in Daniel 9, 26, there is a prophecy about Mashiach, the anointed, the Messiah. And it is said that he will be cut off without anyone coming to his aid. The term for cut off is karat. It is used in Leviticus 20.17 as in other places in the Mosaic Code to describe execution. So Messiah will be executed and no one is coming to his aid. Welcome to another tidbit from the book of Daniel. I'm Dr. Paul Peterson. We are moving into the second part of chapter 9, one of the most intriguing chapters in the Old Testament. I do not pretend to cover it all. This is, after all, only tidbits. Daniel 9 consists of a prayer, a long prayer, followed by an epiphany by the angel Gabriel, described in verses 20 to 23, and then an oracle, a prophecy, in verses 24 to 27. Let's look at it. The background, the literary context, is that Daniel had received a vision in chapter 8. Three of the four elements of the vision had been explained. One regarding time was not explained. Daniel, now studying the prophecies of Jeremiah, realizes that the time of 70 years are up, but he also knows that he and his people have to confess their sins in order for them to return, and so he does, hoping that the captivity will not be extended. And he climaxes his prayer with the phrase, Do not delay. And then Gabriel arrives, and it is explicitly in this epiphany uh, underlined that this is the same Gabriel as in the previous chapter. Notice, while I was speaking and praying, Daniel Verse, nine, verse uh, 20 in chapter 9. While I was still in prayer, verse 21, Gabriel, the man I had seen in an earlier vision, came to me, and so on. So this is the same one. And the words Gabriel is are using in speaking to Daniel and explaining it to him are reminiscent of what was said to him in chapter 8 when a voice asked him, across the canal of Ulai, explain Daniel's uh, mission. And this is a phrase you have in verse 22. I have come to give you insight and understanding, and so on. Therefore, consider the message, verse 23, and understand the vision. So now it comes. Gabriel gives Daniel an explanation, a prophecy, that will enlighten his mind, west, make his soul at ease. And this is the prophecy about the 70 weeks. It's intriguing. It's also a little difficult. Translations sometimes vary. As we read it in most translations for practical reasons, it is not set up as poetry, Nevertheless, it does actually have clear poetic value. It is on the borderline between prose and pro poetry, and it is well structured. We'll return to that in a moment. But first, a word about the timing, or the time phrase. 70 weeks. Sometimes, like New International Version, it is said sevens indicating that this is not meant to be weeks, that is simply a grammatical mistake. It is weeks in verse 27 that is indicated by the full uh, writing of the term for week, Shabua. It is not seven, it is weeks. So when it is used symbolically, it means that the weeks stand as a symbol for another time period. They are not to be taken in a literal sense. And normally we would say 
There are seven days in a week. The week, the, the week stands for seven days equals seven years. Now, the term for weeks may be masculine or feminine. It is a masculine that is used in verse 24. That does actually indicate, as it does with, with terms that have both genders, that this is now an unbroken, a full period. So the 70 weeks are not to be split up like some people would do in the so-called gap theory. They cover one unbroken period of 70 times 7 years, that is 490 years. History is not my uh, specific expertise. I'm an exedite theologian. But if you look at the dates that are described, you have an issue of uh, from a Persian king, most likely, and the one that is of significance came out in 458, implemented in 457. So one of these years you choose. You have then a period of 62 or 49. We do not exactly know uh, what happened there. Uh, we do not have sources enough. But as you move on, you come to the time of Jesus' ministry, his baptism in the 15 years of Tiberius. That is pretty close to 27. And you can argue a little back and forth, but that is uh, arguable, the, the, the obvious choice. When was Jesus crucified? 30 or 31, most scholars would say it's 30, but that, that is one year on one the other side. And then you have Stephen's um, stoning, 34 is likely. Now, you could have some questions with the, each one of these periods that cover the 490 years, but when you look at the accumulative value, it is striking that you have a prophecy speaking about the cutting off of Messiah in the midst of the week. And it's in the midst of the week in verse 27, not the last part of the week, just like in the same expression in, in Joshua 10 is describing the sun standing still in the midst of heaven, not in the latter parts of heaven. When you look at this accumulation of evidence, then it is striking how well it seems to fit. Imagine hundreds of years before. A prophecy would tell about the cutting off of Messiah. In the midst of this week, I often come back to this prophecy uh, with, with a sense of awe and in order to strengthen my faith. But let's then look at the prophecy in a little more detail. The oracle on the prophecy from 24 to 27 is divided into two parts. 24 is the prologue. 25 to 27 is then the proper oracle. In the prologue you have what is generally going to happen from a theological perspective and then you have more historical dates in the uh, prophecy as such. Now let me first point out that a number of features link the two, three parts of the book, of, of the chapter, together. There is a close connection between the prayer, the introduction, and the oracle, sometimes overlooked by critical scholars. Now, for instance, the tetragrammaton, that is the four-letter word for the name of God, often said Yahweh, traditional Jehovah, is found both in the introduction, verse 2 and 4, in the prayer, several times, 8, 10, 13, 14, and in the epiphany. The word for prophet is found in the introduction, in the prayer and the oracle. The name Israel is found in the prayer and in the oracle. The name Jerusalem is found throughout, in all three sections. And you have other. Several verbal links are found between the prayer and the context, Gaining wisdom, sakal in verse 13 and verse 25. The term shub, repent or return, verses 13 and 25. So you have a number of features that link the prophecy closely to the prayer. 
in spite of what you may find in some critical commentaries. Now, if you look at the structure, it is even more striking. The prologue, verse 24, I have to say I built this on the excellent study by Jacques Dukan, presented several times many years ago, an article on Daniel, on the oracle in Daniel 9. 24, the prologue, is structured like this. You have first words that are linked to the people and their transgression, and then you have some that are linked to the holy city. Now notice, this is a challenge in the prayer. The acts of the people, the sins of the people, have led to destruction of the city and the temple. You have a similar structure when you read and study the, pro, the, the, the oracle as such. Verses 25 to 27 are structured similarly. The first part of each of these verses deal with the issue of sin and salvation. The second part deal with, deals with the fate of Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem. In specific, the temple and the city of the people of Daniel. That is the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In the first half of each of these verses, you find the references to time and to Messiah. In the second part, to the temple. It is closely structured. It makes sense. It is the sin of the people that lead to the destruction. This is the content of his prayer. This is how the oracle, the answer by Gabriel, is structured. Now, what is then the way that this particular prophecy explains to Daniel what was left unexplained from chapter 8. And the interesting thing is, as you read the various translations, you may be confused, but let me just uh, point to this one. It is said in chapter 26 that there will be a destruction of the city and the sanctuary. It is then said that in 27 he will confirm the covenant with many and in the middle of the week he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. You have a kind of ambiguity. It has been said in verse 24 that there will be a heavenly sanctuary anointed at the same time or a high sanctuary anointed. At the same time it shall be destroyed. You have the fact that Messiah will confirm the covenant, at the same time, sacrifices will not continue, they will be abolished. How can both be true? And the answer is clear. One aspect deals with the sanctuary and the city on earth, but the other deals with the sanctuary and the city in heaven. What Daniel saw in chapter 8 had to do not with the sanctuary, in Jerusalem on earth but with the sanctuary in heaven. That is how Daniel is being explained the longer prophecy in Daniel 8. So you have a shorter more narrow focus in the historical part of chapter 8 but at the same time opening moving away from the more narrow Levitical aspect to a universal aspect. Don't get me wrong. This is not to say that now Christians replace the Jews. There's no replacement. It is in inclusion. That is, it becomes more universal. The moment the sanctuary in heaven is anointed, dedicated, and Christ as the sacrifice is able to function as a fully valuable high priest, that moment, the sanctuary on earth, in the literal geographic Jerusalem, ceases to contain any religious significance. This is a move from that narrow perspective to a more universal perspective. We find that in the prophecy in Daniel 8, and in Gabriel's answer to Daniel here in 9, he makes that clear to Daniel. There is one 
final aspects that I would like to to uh, point to. That is that in uh, the prophecy, you have a remarkable use of pronouns and also remarkable use of uh, determined or non-determined expressions, which indicate that what is being dealt with when the sin is taken care of, as described in verse 24, is not simply the historical transgressions of the Jewish people or other people. This is sin as such. Not only the Jewish sin, my sin, your sin, the sins of everyone. This is pointing to the Christ who came, as John pointed to him, behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. And that Lamb, that Messiah, is there for the Messiah par excellence, not just one high priest on earth or one king. This is the one and only just as his sacrifice was brought once and for all. Thank you for listening to another tidbit from Daniel 9, acknowledging in all that there is far more to say. I will invite you back as we continue with tidbits from Daniel 10, 11 and 12. Thank you.